بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين. Okay, um, inshallah today all of you must be very excited about our uh, topic, uh, very special, very emotional uh, and essential topic, the mother-daughter bond. And um, as we explore this mother, very special mother-daughter bond today, um, we're blessed to do that uh, in the shade of divine guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, um, has blessed us with. And this divine scheme that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed before us allows us to understand uh, our roles. Each and every one of us does, uh, knows clearly what uh, his or her role uh, is in every uh, aspect, whether that's a mother, a daughter, or any of the other roles that we play throughout our lives. In fact, the wombs, um, as uh, ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have a sanctity in Islam. The wombs that bore us um, that are something that are sacred before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says actually in the very first verse of the chapter that is dedicated to women, which all of you know, Surah Al-Nisa, which is chapter 4, uh, verse 1, Allah subhanahu wa says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّتِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَوْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ رَقِيبًا Which means that fear Allah through which you ask uh, each other for your mutual rights and also fear, yani be aware of the al-arham which are the wombs that bore you. So this is something that we have to be careful in regard to the rights of the wombs that bore us. Obviously it's a uh, direct um, indication to our mothers. Now, sometimes when exploring um, various relationships, especially in the Islamic context, especially that between a husband and a wife, sometimes we have these uh, whisperings um, when our nafs talks to us um, in terms of the privileges that the husband enjoys uh, in some respects. And um, this is kind of important as women to understand because um, there, especially because of, there's a verse in the Quran, chapter number 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 220, which actually talks about um, some of the privileges that a um, man enjoys. For example, the verse, uh, that for the man there is a degree uh, over the women, and Allah is and indeed Allah is um, great and uh, all wise. Now, this is in the context of the husband and wife uh, relationship where the man has been um, given a degree over uh, the wife and we have to understand that this degree is a degree in terms of authority and responsibility okay so have we ever contemplated how the mother this is one degree daraja in arabic refers to one degree have we ever come to contemplated how the mother has been given three degrees over the father and this is what the Prophet Sallallahu actually has told us in the hadith where we, which we all know about when a man came uh, to the Prophet Sallallahu asking about who had the uh, most right over his companionship. Ya Rasulullah man haqqul nasu bi husni sahabati which means uh, who has the most right over me. And the Prophet Sallallahu uh, said umuk right the famous reply your mother and he asked thumma man then who and he said your mother and then he asked who again. And he said, your mother. And finally, the fourth time, he said, your father. And this is uh, an authentic uh, narration. Now, what are some of the reasons uh, for this favoring of the mother over the father? Some of these uh, reasons are very beneficial uh, for us to contemplate, especially in becoming better daughters. Um, and, the, and we're going to look directly at the Quran. The verse uh, is in front of you, what the Quran itself says about the brave struggles of a mother. Uh, in Surah Al-Luqman, Verse number 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَحْنًا عَلَى وَحْنًا وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامِينًا أَنْ أَشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ And the verse is very interesting because it starts out by saying that we have exhorted the human being about his parents, yani the mother and the father. But then who does it mention? The verse mentions only the mother. There's no mention of uh, the father or his service. The verse only mentions, as you can see, the um, mother who bears him weakness upon weakness and then his uh, feeding, yani the nursing stage is for two years that you should be grateful to uh, me, referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, and to your parents. Now, the verse mentions two aspects that every mother goes through, which is that of bearing the child which is pregnant, uh, or rather before she bears the child, the period of pregnancy, and then the period of breastfeeding or nursing. What is between the two? that the verse does not mention. That is obviously implied after pregnancy and before uh, the breastfeeding is the period of the actual labor that the mother has to go through to 
bear the child and bring it into the world. So these are the three stages that some scholars have referred to, which give the mother those three ranks that she has over the father, because obviously he, does not, he cannot go through any of these. And I just wanted to um, cite something and the next uh, slide on the on labor, which is implied in these three verses and as part of in this verse and as part of the three degrees, on uh, what labor pain is kind of like. And I don't want to scare those of you that have not gone through the experience. Uh, I apologize if I do that. But labor pain. This is in an article by uh, Andre Van Zander. He says labor pain is among the most severe pain human beings experience, and compares in its intensity to severe cancer pain or pain from the amputation of a digit. Uh, I apologize for the unmarried ones among us. Labor pain is described as intolerable in about one third of women. So really it's after experiencing labor that you realize how truly no one else can do for you what your mother has already done. And you didn't even know it. You had no idea. No one can do for what she has already done and you can never do for her what she just did for you before you were even born. Before any of the other many endless duties that she will now execute for you or even started. So this is um, why, you know, we're talking about the pedestal. Why does Islam place the woman on the pedestal that she is? This is these are some of the reasons. Another uh, is the extra dimension. This is uh, point number two in terms of why she has this extraordinary rank. It's the extra dimension of child rearing itself, of raising the child itself. For a good mother, this is called tarbiya, right? She's doing tarbiya of her uh, children, tarbiya al awlad, raising the child in a good manner. And for the mother who's not so skilled, it's just having to deal with the child, right? So either you're doing it well or you're just dealing with them. And either way, the way the mother experiences dealing with the children, a father can never have to experience that unless he's a single dedicated father. And that's that's a different discussion. The birth of a child completely changes the life of the mother and it overtakes it really uh, to be to be realistic. Overtakes your life. Yani this is the greatest complete total intrusion of the highest degree into another's life. The way a child uh, the way the impact uh, of a child is in the mother's life. He or she does not spare her in sickness in weakness, the late hours of the night, the early hours of the dawn, when she is forced to, uh, to rise to soothe her, uh, her crying infant. And if it's a breastfeeding infant, the father can't do much anyway. Many infants uh, in the early months are exclusively breastfed, so sometimes the fathers are in blissful sleep even in another room, and we've seen this uh, happen a lot. So, you know, sometimes we see that the father's schedule, the new, a new father's schedule is not even altered that much, whereas um, the mother's life has changed forever. Now, should this uh, frustrate us as women? You know, as weak human beings, it is frustrating at times. But as believing women, what we have to do is strive to remember that no one else can really do for the child what you are able to do for it. No one else can meet its needs uh, the, the way a good mother uh, can meet its needs, the way she can nurture and care for it. And, uh, you know, and this is kind of talking about the daraja, the one daraja that the husband has over the wife and the mother uh, has over the father, trying to understand all of this together. Just like uh, no one else can do for the child what the mother can do for it, especially in its infancy, in the same way, the way a husband can, a good husband, the way he can offer protection and support for a wife, no one else can really do for him. So this is trying, just trying to understand, uh, you know, the grand scheme of things, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, um, you know, divided uh, and raised some uh, people in ranks over others. Now, and this is part of the mizan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established. We know this from Surah Al-Rahman, وَالسَّمَاءَ فَعَهَا الْوَضَعَ mizan أَلَّا تَدَغُوا فِي الْمِزَانِ That you should not upset the balance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in relationships, in favoring some over others rather, uh, accepted as part of His uh, wisdom. This is why we have to honor uh, the mother the way we do. Uh, this is very important for uh, daughters to uh, be reminded of. Um, because of her exceptional service, and devotion, she has this extra rank, and she deserves the utmost respect, uh, honor, and dedication. Now, that was just a brief uh, introduction about the mother and where she stands in Islam. Now, why are we talking about mothers and daughters today? The mother-daughter bond, the mother-daughter relationship. What is the significance of this practically uh, for each and every one of us? And the first um, significance, which is obviously um, most important, is that she is one of the uh, paths to Jannah. 
obviously. This is the first thing that uh, is most important to all of us. The reason we're here is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test us. Liyabaluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Mulk, this is the purpose of our creation, to see which one of you is best in deeds. And this is the um, one of the paths, one of the ways we can earn uh, the paradise uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for the believers. Once you know that a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and asked him, uh, what uh, I, ha I want to participate in jihad, how can I do that? But the Prophet ﷺ asked him, do you have parents? And he said, yes. And he said, فَفِيهِمَا فَجَاهِدْ Which means that in them exert yourself. Yani your jihad is in them, is in serving them. So undoubtedly this is one of the um, uh, direct paths to, uh, to Jannah. Another um, aspect why this bond is significant, why we have to talk about it, is because for women or girls, this uh, relationship, the kind of relationship that she has with her mother, sets the tone for future relationships. It affects every other significant close relationship she will ever enter into for the rest of her life. And this is actually based on uh, studies conducted in various um, uh, universities. My associate professor, Dr. Rastogi, she's a licensed um, uh, marriage and family uh, therapist at the University of Chicago. She mentions this is the most significant intergenerational relationship. Yani between two generations, this is the most significant bond that there can possibly be. The, the, she, uh, Dr. Linda Mental mentions the mother-daughter relationship is the perfect arena to develop and practice relationship building skills that form and shape every other relationship in a woman's life because the mother-daughter bond is such a close one. So there's no way that this bond is not going to affect other bonds that you will form um, in the future. And in the Islamic context, having a good a close uh, bond with your mother, this is one of the most beloved acts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What they called um, good close relations and bonds, in Islam we have a term for it, it's called Bilal Walidain, right? Goodness to parents. And of course mothers have the extra uh, three degrees over um, over the father. So once a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, actually Abdullah bin Masood, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which the most uh, beloved deed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was. And after mentioning the prayer, Salah in its proper time, he said, This is one of the most beloved acts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we look at the flip side of that, to disobey them, to displease them, to dishonor them, this is one of the greatest kabair. This is one of the greatest uh, acts of uh, sinfulness and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once a, um, the Prophet وسلم, was asked about the greatest sins, and after mentioning shirk, second only to shirk was uquq al which is being disobedient, displeasing, rebellious uh, to parents. So for us, preserving a close um, mother-daughter relationship is not just, you know, simply a matter of, of just, you know, some significance. It's a matter of akhirah and a matter of jannah for us. Now let's talk about uh, real mothers, real mothers today. Now. The mother is the first teacher, right? Many say she's the first school. We have to uh, obviously benefit from her wisdom. It's a, it's a great loss to not be able to benefit from you know, the experience that our uh, mothers have. And it's, I think, a huge accomplishment on the part of a mother if she's now able to pass on all of her talents, all of her skill and knowledge to her daughters. This is really not happening. Um, we have, you know, we can have very talented mothers at times, but you will see their daughters, they have not really absorbed and been uh, given uh, of that training. So what is going on? What is uh, lacking? Why is this uh, baton not being passed on? Now, we talked already about the great status that a mother enjoys in Islam, but we want to also be realistic now uh, about what the current generation is, is, is receiving in terms of tarbiyah. You know, Oh, we don't want to play a blame game right now, okay? But we have to understand why families are falling apart. Why do we have a Muslim marriage crisis? Why has the divorce uh, rate skyrocketed? Uh, it's reached a record high among Muslims where it's about to equal the national regular average of the non-Muslims. Why is that? Why is it with increased education technology, the ability to cope with reality is decreasing among our youth, especially in relationships? Why is there less tolerance and stamina in dealing with relationship dissent? When there's dissent, disagreement, this just ends in a breakup, breakdown. So in a culture of a supposed increased freedom for women, the single mom, which 
now there are more single moms in America than there were ever before experienced in recorded American history. The, current, the number of single moms we have today. So why is it with increasing freedom we have more of these types of moms, many of which are not Muslim. You will find an increasing number of single Muslim moms um, as well. So are they really more free in this culture of greater uh, freedom? Or is she more constrained in the overburdening cycle of single motherhood? It's hard enough to raise children on your own with a supportive husband and a stable uh, family household. How is the single mom coping with this? Now, mothers have to realize the various levels at which training is now due um, for their daughters if we want to somehow try to control the crisis, which is why it's very important that we understand the significance of these types of topics because it's really impacting our future um, in, in, in North America. There are many frontiers that the mother now has to do tarbiya at because there's so many more frontiers of challenge that she faces in the context we're living in. We have to train them to be devout Muslimat. This is our first priority. Then they also, have, at the same time, be effective household managers, affectionate caretakers, not forced into taking care, affectionate caretakers, diligent students of Quran and knowledge, obedient and supportive uh, spouses, productive builders, contributors to society. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And, and you know, I don't want us to lose hope because we all only have to look to the past to see that this was actually done. Many, many times throughout the history of Islam, we see, you know, innumerable shiny examples of female scholarship and uh, women who were exactly this and so much more. In fact, um, there's a great compilation by uh, Sheikh Nadwi, he talks about the female scholars of hadith in the past and he records no less than 40,000 muhadithat. Did we ever even hear about them? We probably don't even know a single name. But it has happened and it can happen again. And what is lacking in getting from that point you know, to, to moving forward, what is lacking in between? It's tarbiyah. Inadequate tarbiyah of both boys and girls. We're not going to point, you know, the, a finger at the girls only. Of both, both, both boys and girls, the tarbiyah is lacking before marriage, which is why they're falling apart. And then there's a lot of misguided nasiha or advice given to couples that are in trouble. Unfortunately, a lot of time by their own families. This is why we are really uh, experiencing this uh, awful Muslim marriage crisis. Now, what we also want to look at is. What happens when this mother-daughter bond, the significance of which we touched upon, what happens when it's not healthy? When it's not a healthy, close, affectionate bond? Well, obviously, it's going to lead to multiple problems. You know, we don't have to wait till akhira, till yom al qiyamah, to see the evil effects of, you know, having been bad to your mother. Um, the punishments of, of that begin in dunya. This is actually one of the few sins, being disobedient to parents, this is one of the few sins that um, its punishment is given in dunya before akhirah. Now, one of the most recent manifestations uh, that are plaguing uh, us here today, number one, the first problem, and this is what I want to talk about, there be a pitfalls. These are mistakes you don't want to make as a mother. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that young mothers are here today. The first thing is that when your tarbiyah is not Islamically oriented from the start. A lot of times mothers come to me, the daughter is 17, 18 years old, Sister, can you please talk to my daughter about wearing hijab? And I look at the mother, she's not wearing hijab. And, you know, it boggles my mind. And, you know, I said, now, you're asking me now, after 17 years have passed? It's, it's too late. It's like, you know, 10 years too late. So it really has to start from the beginning. This is what the Prophet ﷺ has guided us to. He has told us that we have to raise our children from the very beginning on uh, the recitation of the Qur'an, on his love and the love of his family. Yani to have them oriented in the right direction from the beginning, this is why Salah is mandated at such an early age. Someone who does not pray at seven, which is the recommended prophetic age, how will he or she pray at 17? It doesn't happen overnight. It has to be inculcated from the very beginning. And there is such a wisdom in teaching children from the beginning because Islam when taught from the beginning, they will understand the concept of bilawali. They will understand the concept of being good to parents because this is something that Allah uh, will make Allah happy. And if when you ch explain it to a child like that, um, you're going to most likely, inshallah, produce a dutiful 
child, a dutiful daughter, which then is going to turn into a dutiful spouse, right? A responsible, um, affectionate wife, uh, inshallah. So really, the seeds are planted from the very beginning. It's very unlikely that a good, dutiful daughter is going to turn into a rebellious, horrible wife. You know, that's highly unlikely. So, in, you know, if we plant the seeds right from the beginning, we can really nip it in the bud. A second um, mistake that our culture makes, and I may get into some trouble for this, but there really sometimes is an overemphasis on education. Education is a wonderful thing. Alhamdulillah, we are all college graduates and pursuing higher degrees, and this is something we should, we should all do when it's needed. And it's not going to change. We're not going to you know, go back to not sending our daughters to college. But sometimes it's emphasized to a point where it is at the expense of effective domestic management training for the daughter. So that she graduates with a uh, beautiful you know, uh, master's in biochemistry and she gets married the next day and doesn't know how to make an omelet for a mother-in-law. Now that's a problem, right? It's, it's, um, it's, because it's more of a problem for her than it is for the mother-in-law. And if she's nice, she'll, uh, and she'll explain it to her. But if she's not so nice, the, uh, you know, the daughter is going to be in a horrible, uh, awkward situation. Who will she, the daughter herself, blame before she, anyone else blames? The mother. She will feel betrayed that my mom did not prepare me for the real world. So this is, eventually it adds up to um, incre incredible, uh, you know, detriment to the stability of the household, especially if the in-laws are not the most understanding folks in the world. So, um, and you don't want, you know, to put your mother in this type of a situation either, you know. You really want to be able to uh, defend her and the way she trained you. So, you need to help each other do that, inshallah. So, what, what do we do from the beginning? Critical. For the mother to assign and involve her daughter in simple household tasks. From the beginning. My daughter is three years old. She knows how to clean the entire living room. She does, mashallah, an excellent job. Uh, you know, at doing that. My uh, other daughter who's, he, who's here is six. She, mashallah, vacuumed beautifully last night. It was, I mean, I did have to re-vacuum, but she did, that's just me. But it was beautifully done, you know. So if you can, not only does, uh, does she get uh, into the habit of doing household work, but what happens is you're creating a sense of tenderness in the daughter towards the mom. I have to help mommy. I can't let her do this by herself. She is, begins to feel a caring responsibility towards the mom and not let her be overworked. Because if you don't do this from the beginning, later on what happens is that when you're older, your mother expects you to do it, but she's never really gotten you involved, so you don't know how to do it. And then she feels betrayed and bitter and angry. And both of you are lost as to how this happened. So you have to make her feel that she must be there to help her and be tender. Uh, towards her mom. And you know, when, when mothers do, do, do this from the start, the daughter ident naturally identifies uh, herself with this role. And she will not be able to cast off this identity as an adult. I've seen uh, people who grew up like this, always helping their mothers, always involved in you know caring for her. And till this day, as adults in their 30s and beyond, late 30s, they still can't cast off that identity. They still feel obligated even after marriage that I have to go and help my mother. This is how they grew up, this is how they identify them, this is how they see themselves. They feel like a bad daughter if they don't go out of the way to make sure that mom is helped. These are the kinds of you know, daughters, inshallah, that we want to try to be uh, raising. And also in an effort to help girls with their inevitable um, destiny of child rearing, you know, whether you like it or not. Inshallah, I hope you are looking forward to having children, but if you're not, it's going to happen. So we need to train them by helping, having them help with their younger siblings. Okay, and you have to give them those responsibilities, you have to make them responsible for those things which require patience. Like feeding them, like taking them to the bathroom, like story time, tasks that force them to be patient. Because if you don't do that, she will not know what hit her when she has kids of her own. If she does not know how to be patient with an illogical, unreasonable human being, that's called a child, um, she, you know, it will overwhelm her into uh, you know, a very depressed uh, state. Postpartum depression, you know, they don't have it for nothing. So, and you know, nowadays we don't have much, uh, uh, you know, help. The mother doesn't have much help with her newly born ch uh, child or young children because of the nuclear family, family system we live in. We don't have the advantage of, believe it or not, mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and, you know, uh, that system did have its advantages. And it's uh, funny, 
what I used to recommend to um, to young uh, unmarried sisters is that uh, in preparation for an inshallah marriage, you should go to your cousin's house and take care of their sick children um, while you're sick uh, and you're holding a part-time job and you're taking some Islamic class on the side. You know, that's really the field work. Until I ran into this email, which is even more, um, I have to share with you. It's a really good way to discover how the nights might feel for a young a parent, okay? Uh, so this is how you train yourself to, if you're thinking of becoming a parent or you will become a parent, this is what you need to do to kind of get used to how, how it will be, how life will be like. Number one, get home from work and immediately begin walking around the living room from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. carrying a wet bag weighing approximately 8 to 12 pounds. Okay, the child. Would the radio turn to static or some other obnoxious sound? Play loudly. This is your baby. Eat cold food with one hand for dinner. I do this all the time. Well, it's not cold, but... Number two, at 10 p.m., okay, 5 to 10, you walked in the room. At 10 p.m., put the bag gently down, set the alarm for midnight, and go to sleep. Get up at 12 midnight and walk around the living room again with the bag until 1 a.m. <laughs> set the alarm for 3 a.m. As you can't get back to sleep, get up at 2 a.m. and make a drink and watch an infomercial. <laughs> go to bed at 2.45 a.m. Okay, pray the hajjid, Allah read it. Get up at 3 a.m. when the alarm goes off, sing songs quietly, okay, you sing Quran, until, uh, in the dark until 4 a.m. Okay, get up, make breakfast, get ready for work, and go to work, work hard and be productive. And uh, keep this up for 3 to 5 years, repeat steps 1 through 9. Uh, look cheerful and together. <laughs> so th this is, you're laughing now, you'll be crying later, really. Uh, this, this is really what it's like. And you don't have to be a working mother, you will still feel like this because uh, a mother doesn't have to be working uh, outside of the house to be working. If you have kids, you are working all the time. So that's one thing we really need to get our children to all know from an early, early age. Okay, number three, this is the one that bothers me the most. Uh, there will be a pitfall that I see is very dangerous. When I see mothers tolerating um, a less than respectful attitude from their daughters, from their grown daughters, teenage daughters, or whatever age they're at. This has a horrible impact on their tarbiya. You think you're being nice to them? You think you're letting them off easy, you're being tender to them? You are destroying them. If your uh, daughter cannot respect her mother, how in the world is she going to respect her spouse? Where she doesn't even have that the type of bond and tenderness and closeness, which uh, you know, or feelings that a uh, daughter has towards her mother, she doesn't have that with the stranger she you know she gets married to, someone you haven't known for 20, 25 years of your life. There will not be um, the required uh, respect and demeanor if she is disrespectful to her, uh, to her mom. So this is where mothers, I'm making an appeal to mothers. Please use your God-given parental authority to not tolerate that which cannot lead to any good for her now or for her later and you know if, if we allow this to happen daughters who never submitted or respected parents and on top of that they, they live in this culture of independence on top of that they're college educated good luck with the, them ex accepting spousal authority it's, it's not going to happen and, it's, and this is why we have the Muslim marriage crisis this is part of why we have uh, you know, divorce rates. It, it just does not work out. Um, there's no, and there's, because the daughter hasn't gone to practical, you know, training uh, in the field. So when mom's failing this duty of disciplining, um, she, your mom winds up uh, losing, feeling, dis, uh, you know, respected and appreciated. What happens to the daughter? The daughter is doubling her loss. How? Before marriage, she's incurring the great sin. The, it's one of the kaba'il, one of the major sins. Uh, what the Prophet Sallallahu told us about the seven major sins, this is one of them, only after shirk, is to be disobedient to parents. So she's, number one, incurring that great sin of disobedience and disrespect. And number two, she's lost the um, golden opportunity of serving her parents in the prime of her youth, when she was still unhindered by the multiple responsibilities of her own home when she's married and has one. And this is what the law she experiences before marriage. What happens to her after marriage? She's unable to accept or uh, respect, submit to spousal authority. It, it's not going to happen. And depending on you know the type of magic, and that what some are you know um, loose about it, but others it is, it will not work. So this is something that uh, mothers have to really uh, think about. So is this lack of tarbiya? And we have daughters have to think, and mothers have to think. Is this lack of tarbiya, this consistent toleration for disregard of the moms? Is this what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala really has wanted us to inculcate in our children? 
What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want for the daughters to have? This is what we turn to next, the dutiful, uh, the dutiful daughter. Surah Al-Isra verses 23 to 24. The translation of which is, Your Lord has decreed do not worship anyone but Him. Be good to your parents and should both or any one of them attain old age with you, do not say to them, even if, it's translated as if, yani of. Neither should chide them, but speak to them with respect and be humble and tender to them and say, Lord, show mercy to them as they nurtured me when I was small. Now, this is a, you know, a beautiful um, verse uh, of the Quran which talks about the attitude that daughters, now I'm talking to the daughters. This is the type of attitude that we need to have towards uh, our moms. And, you know, it is said, the, the verse mentioned, do not say even uf to them. The scholars have said that if there was a word that was smaller than uf in the Arabic language, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have used that. There is nothing that is smaller than uf. Yani, do not show even the slightest bit of annoyance to them when you are annoyed with them. Which means it will happen. This is, this is the human tendency in the child. Uh, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the child to be uh, good to the parents. Never says in the Quran, Allah never says in the Quran to the mother be good to the child. Because it's already there. Allah has already placed it in her. He doesn't have to remind her. He has to remind the child, which has the opposite tendencies. To get quickly annoyed, to quickly be easily become irritated. But no matter how annoying you think your parents or mother can be, remember it was not as annoying as labor, the labor you put her through. That was a lot more annoying. So this is something that um, we have to contemplate and seek Allah's reward uh, through it. And what does Allah say in this verse? وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Which means don't reproach them, don't turn them away, don't say something to them that's going to make them turn away from you. Don't, yani don't brush them off. This is called talking back. This is what we call talking back. We're not supposed to talk back to our friends. And it's interesting how when you uh, try to explain to a young child, seven, eight year old, don't talk back, they, won't under, they don't understand what that means. They're, they're just trying to explain themselves, they're just, try, they're just expressing their opinion. They don't know that it's talking back. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, from the daughters to, to her mom, to her dad? Ihsan, Ihsan towards them. This is second only to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even to our non-Muslim mothers, once um, a Sahabi asked the Prophet وسلم, about her mother who was non-Muslim, she said, you know, my mother is coming to visit me and she's not Muslim. So how should I be with her? And he said, be good to her. You, the only thing you're not going to um, obey your non-Muslim mother in is uh, her shirk, right? You are not going to follow her deen. You're not going to associate partners with Allah. But in every other way, she's still your mother. She's still the one who gave birth to you. And she has many, many rights over you. So even, you know, in that regard, we cannot um, become disrespectful because I'm Muslim and you're not. You know, we can't do that to our moms to our dads. Now, subhanAllah, once um, it, w it was asked about a, a person performing hajj, and if they were to do that, performing hajj uh, with their mother on their backs, and if that would be able to pay back the reward or the duties, the struggles of a mom, and it was said to them that they could not even pay her back for one agonizing breath that she experienced while giving birth to that child. Even if you were to do hajj, uh, with your mother on your back, and Hajj is so difficult for those of you that have done it. Um, it it's just subhanAllah, it's one of the most physically, uh, you know, it's a, a boot, boot camp, Islamic boot camp is what it is. And to have a human being, on, uh, an adult on your back the whole time, and, that, and to do that for all the manasik, for all the rights of Hajj, that would still not pay back one breath, that means it's impossible. What is impossible to pay back a debt, then what is what replaces that repayment? Humility. Ihsan. Yani, it's not going to happen. I will not be able to repay. All I can do is be humble and have Ihsan towards you. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places only the validate, only the parents are placed next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani, Allah says, be grateful to me and to your parents. He hasn't, hasn't placed anyone else, not the Prophet, not any other person or group of people next to him. Be grateful to me and be grateful to your parents. Because these two are the sources of our nourishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nourishes us and that He made the parents the means of our nourishment. Without these two, we would perish. If we did not have Allah and we did not have our parents, an infant could not survive. The infant would die. Now, uh, the narration we alluded to earlier when a man came to the Prophet ﷺ seeking permission for jihad. 
And remember I said the Prophet asked him, are your parents alive? And he said yes. And so he, the Prophet told him, exert you in serving them. Yani fafihi ma fajahid. What does this exertion mean? We want to explore the meaning of this exertion, this jihad with the parents. What are, what are the implications of that? Number one, the jihad of the nafs. This is what is required to please your parents. You're going to physically have to exert yourself, emotionally have to restrain your anger. Okay, so there are different, it's just like uh, jihad, you know, it could be physical or it could be uh, emotional or spiritual. This is really required in pleasing them. We can't downplay that. Especially if there are pre-existing tensions and problems, you know, we don't have the greatest relationship in the world with our mom. This is going to require more effort, more jihad. Number two, uh, exert ourselves in tenderness towards them. Not everyone has the ideal tender relationship with their moms. Now, this has to be inculcated. We have to kind of force ourselves, fake it until we make it kind of thing. Next is beautiful companionship. Beautiful companionship. Yani, you want to be the most beautiful friend that your mother has. How are you going to do it? Go figure it out. It's going to be different for everybody. You know? Only you can answer this question uh, for yourself. What is it that ticks your mom off the most? What is it that makes her the happiest? You have to find that out. And this is great training, by the way, for your uh, future relationships uh, with your spouses and others because this, uh, like they said, is the most significant intergenerational relation because it teaches you how to love. Your relationship with your mom teaches you how to love another human being. And the last thing is obedience, of course. This is a given, whether we like it or not. If there's a curfew, if you have to be home by a certain time, certain things you cannot watch or do, you must be compliant, you must be obedient. Now, you know, if all this sounds really hard, just think about Jannah. Jannah, I always say this, Jannah is darajat, right? Increasing levels and ranks. And Jahannam is darakat, lowering. One is lower than the one before it. So climbing up the mountain is harder, right? Climbing up the mountain is easier than coming down, but the view is from the top. So it's going to be difficult, of course, yes. And, you know, we have to all remind each other, but Jannah is worth it. Now, uh, there's a, a nice saying of uh, Ibn Umar, the other advantages we experience in our life being good to our parents. He said, which means that be good to your uh, parents, your children will be good to you. Yani, inshallah, you will reap the rewards of that ihsan that you had towards them. You will reap the rewards of that in um, in this world. And by the way, other righteous deeds, good deeds that we think we're doing, they won't benefit us if we are disobedient to our parents. It's one of those sins, as I told you, that is punished in this world. So, and it also decreases um, potentially one's uh, livelihood and risk, yani risk in life, because there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which means that whoever wants to increase his life and his risk, let him uh, be good to the ties of the womb. And this is the greatest tie, that of the uh, mother. Now, we look at um, the, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, and the reason he's mentioned this is because he told us of a time where mothers would be disrespected. And there's actually hadith number two in the uh, collection of Imam al nawis Arba'in, where the Prophet ﷺ forbode the coming of a time which means that a time will come when the servant will give birth to a master. Now the various interpretations of this, and one interpretation which is uh, that favored by Ibn, the great Muhaddith, uh, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he says, the children will disobey their mothers to the point where they will treat them like a servant. And subhanAllah, it is so painful to see this uh, happening in real life. It is one of the greatest moments of human tragedy when a grown child hurts their parent. This is the ultimate, ultimate betrayal that a person can, can do. So really we have to think about what we are doing now with our parents, how it's going to impact our uh, future life, our marriage, um, future child rearing, um, and the hurt that the mom will experience. It's something that will, you will uh, regret forever really and we want to avoid it, inshallah, when we can. I notice, um, you know, daughters, a lot of times when they have problems with their moms, will try to justify their behavior. Note, in this context, justification, behave, this context, justification will obstruct rectification. There's no way you'll be able to correct yourself, al salah al nafs, if you keep justifying your behavior. There's a time for everything, but this is not the time to justify your behavior. It will not allow you to correct yourself. 
Now, in trying to understand why daughters have such a difficult time, especially for mothers who still have young children, what can we trace this, all of this back to? Why is it so difficult now to raise uh, kids? You know, we don't hear these types of um, uh, complaints from uh, like a generation or two ago especially, but what is it now that is making it so difficult to raise children and to be good mothers? Uh, it's becoming harder and harder to meet the goals that we set out with our children, for our children. Well, first of all, we live in a very selfish social context. Very selfish social context we live in. It's, we live in an individualistic society. It's not a communal um, society. It's an individualistic society where the focus is on me, mine and mine, right? That's the focus. It's not we, us, together. So we're trying to raise selfless, some of selfless daughters in a selfish society. This is very difficult to do. Rather than focusing on our rights, what we kind of have to shift the focus of our daughters and of ourselves is towards fulfilling our duties. Let's not focus so much on my rights. Let me focus more on my duties. Let's be more concerned about what I can do for the other person rather than wait and expect that it be done for me. So where does this practically start with the mother? When she demands that her daughter or son they sacrifice for their siblings. Because this is the first small community that a child grows up in, right? That of his parents and his siblings. So here we need to practice for the real world, okay? Under the loving, uh, gentle care of their parents. So the mom has to demand that this, um, you know, the daughter sacrifice for her brother from a young age, and this is something as simple as getting uh, the other a glass of water, you know. Simple things like that will make, uh, force them to get up, stop what they're doing, and feel responsible for this task. Anything that will kind of induce that type of effect, this is very important. But from the beginning, they have this sense of sacrifice, because then they'll be able to do this um, in the future with their own children and their, uh, and their spouses. Now, all this sounds wonderful and, um, you know, very idealistic. Now, it's time to be realistic. There's so many pressures on young mothers, especially those that are new to motherhood, relatively new kids uh, that are still not teenagers. The type of uh, environment we're living in, we have to recognize what it's become and why it's making it so much harder for us to raise. So the first thing is that we live in the post-9-11 world. Post-9-11 world, raising children is very different from how it was for our moms. We have to be so careful how we teach them the proper way of being true to your Islam, you know, without getting into the type of trouble and attention that we really now have. We have the, um, for better or worse, the attention of the international media is always on us. We're always, um, you know, in focus. So we have to be able to raise children that are uh, conscientious of this focus, that realize that each and every one of us is an ambassador uh, of Islam how we're going to reflect that in our uh, dealing with others. Number two, which is a huge challenge, this is probably, personally I feel the biggest challenge uh, for young mothers, the information age. So much uh, information is so easily accessible, never before in history was so much information available uh, with such ease. Obviously the good and the bad, you know, and uh, plausibly we can argue that there's more harmful material, for example, on the internet. Um, only a click away, and just to tell, just to give you an idea of the uh, of what the internet has done, it has done a great service, greatly facilitated the usage of pornographic sites. This is one of the greatest. We can't even call it a service, but just to give you an understanding of the many uh, you know new realities we now have to face, 30 million daily viewers of porn on the internet. One in four people who have access to it at work view it at work. And many of these are married people. And now we have this problem, believe it or not, rising among Muslim married couples. Where now sisters are finding and complaining about having discovered their husband on these sites. What is this going to do for the marriages? And if you don't believe me that this is rampant among practicing, otherwise practicing Muslims that are active in their communities, if you don't believe me, read the testimonials for yourself. Self-confessions, testimonials of practicing Muslim men that are otherwise active in their communities. SubhanAllah, it's unbelievable the way the world has changed 
within a decade, uh, or a little more than a decade now. 91 is when it officially came out, the internet, and SubhanAllah, there's just so, it's just so easy to uh, uh, slip. Now the third uh, challenge that we have as mothers is what I call the heightened intelligence of the current generation. You know, we have to face it, we were just, uh, you know, we're not, we were not as smart as kids as our kids are. They're just so much brighter, so much sharper. Our mothers can attest to this. I remember, um, for example, now when a child is born, my daughter herself actually did this, when she was born, um, she was like maybe one second old, literally, and she grabbed onto the coat of the doctor. Now, when I tell this to people, my uh, an older friend, she told me that before, a generation ago, for two months, the child, the newborn, would not open her eyes. SubhanAllah, yani, there's a real tangible difference in the uh, sense of perception and intelligence that our uh, children now um, are exhibiting. Now, this, of course, can be a very positive thing, but only if it's steered in the right direction. What does this mean? A much greater level of parental, especially mommy involvement, is necessary to steer this in the right direction. Otherwise, all that intelligence and information access can lead to total uh, distance and destruction uh, for the child. You know, I don't want to paint a bleak picture, but I think it's better to be more aware than less aware uh, as parents uh, what, we're, what we're facing. Now to end, to close, we want to kind of um, talk about seven tips to get close or closer. The first thing for between a mother and a daughter is that um, the daughter has to acknowledge and recognize the treasure that she has in the mom. Okay, after this um, lecture is over, which you are waiting for, I want all the daughters and child to hug their moms. Okay? All the daughters are on this side, the moms are on that side. Okay, you're going to cross sides and give your mother a big hug and thank her for the unpayable debt that you owe to her. Really, it's an unpayable debt. And here I wanted to quote uh, Professor Lee Sharpley. She's the director of the Women's, uh, women's Studies uh, at the University of Maine. She says, the original love relationship is with the mother. If we as daughters don't acknowledge that, we're closing ourselves off from a great resource, a great source of power, fulfillment, and understanding of ourselves. So really, you know, she's a reservoir of learning. Your mother is a treasure of love and experience. You need to reach out to her, okay? And the more you learn to make peace and find a meaningful, meaningful connection with your mom, the richer other relationships will be. This is also from her comment. Number two is uh, communication, right? Now, we may have old total patterns of communication, and if they don't work, find a new way. For example, if you can't um, talk to your mom, call her. If you can't call her, write her a letter. Leave her a note. You know, this will mean the world to her, really. And it will really uh, start to break, uh, break the ice and make things easier, inshallah. Um, number three, that I want to talk about acceptance. Just as daughters, you know, want their space, they want to be accepted um, for who they are. Also, we have to accept our moms for who they are. Not be so critical of their, uh, you know, child rearing methods. Not think of them as old, label them as old fashioned. We don't like to be labeled. Why do we want to label our moms? That they're old fashioned, they're out of touch, they don't understand, they didn't grow up here. You know, give them a chance. Number, uh, the next one, intention. You know, a parent um, does the best that she can, and behind every action she has the best intention. And sometimes, it, you know, a given action may not have the best result, may not even turn out to be what the mom intended, but don't look at the action and how, you know, it didn't work out. Rather, look at the intention behind it. Because we go through the same thing. Sometimes we intend certain things and they don't always work out for the best. So look at the intention. Don't judge the, out, the action by its outcome. Look at the intention behind it. So will increase your understanding and tenderness towards your mom. Next thing, and this is a great thing, to have some kind of a mother-daughter tradition. You know, we used to have a mother-daughter day. Um, and you know, anything that you do, two can do together, whether it's a long walk after dinner, whether it's, you know, going out to eat, whatever it is, you know, knitting a sweater together, this may not be very popular, but, um, you know, <laughs> any, anything, any place of mutual liking, anything that you can, uh, reading a helpful book on emotional, you know, healing, forgiveness, closeness, whatever you want to do, you know, do something, make it a tradition, you know, once a week, once every two weeks, it's something you do with mom, it's fun. Um, now to moms, I'm going to say, as we end, start understanding the ramifications of your own behavior. This is modeling, okay? Whether we like it or not, this is for moms, young and old. 
what the way they, the way we behave is going to be reflected in the way our daughters behave, whether they like it or not. So we don't want to model behaviors. We don't want them duplicating. If we're doing something, they will do it. And this requires us to kind of be on our best behavior all the time, which is the hardest thing to do. And the last thing is, um, to the moms as well, is to trust your daughters. Trust them, uh, appreciate them, and support them in, um, in what they're trying to accomplish. Inshallah, as long as it's a noble, permissible goal, try to extend, extend um, their support to you because they just like, um, you know, this is something that they need more than anything. It means uh, so much to them if you're able to extend your support, for example, um, in noble efforts like YM, right? They didn't ask me to say this. Yeah. So if you're, alhamdulillah, your daughter's involved in, uh, you know, something like this, uh, uh, try to accommodate that. Of course, the daughter has to remember the curfew, which I already mentioned, but this is something that would really, uh, inshallah, help her thrive. Now, for moms that are feeling unappreciated, I want to remind you that you are the one that teaches or has taught your daughter how to treat you. So if you're feeling unappreciated, you need to tell your daughter how you want the relationship to change. Be specific, because they may be lost. For daughters, your mom wants and needs to feel appreciated and loved by you. You have to sincerely reach out to her, convey that love and that appreciation. And um, the last thing that we all have to understand about parents, one thing we all have to understand about parents, whether they're uh, young children or not so young children, Alhamdulillah, all of us that are blessed with parents, mom and dads, they come with an invisible tag. And this is why the parents have so many rights in Islam. Because of this tag, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want us to be regretful later. The, the last thing that I wanted to share is that parents come with the tag for a limited time only. This is the painful tag that they come with. They're not going to be around forever. You know, when we're young, we kind of take that uh, for granted. We think they're always going to be here. One day you'll wake up and they're not going to be there. So I want us all to remember, inshallah, and take advantage of this reminder for a limited time only. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Thank you, Samara. Thank you.